All right. Well, hello, everyone. Brian Zimmerman here, executive editor of Jazz Is Magazine and host of Jazz Is Live, coming to you live early in the morning with a little bit of a different look. I'm on my cell phone here. Kind of had some technical difficulties this morning, but hey, that's just the way it goes. The show must go on. Anyway, we've got an awesome episode in store for you today. We are celebrating jazz and film on today's episode. And to do that, we are going to be joined by two guests who know jazz and movies inside and out. Those would be uh, actor, director, composer, Andy Garcia, and executive producer and jazz drummer, Richard Barada. You know, Andy, you know from such films as The Godfather Part Three, Ocean's Eleven, Eternal Affairs, uh, and Richard has executive produced for a number of films uh, you have no doubt seen, including most recently, Joker uh, and The Irishman. So Richard also has a new album coming out in September on Savant Records called Music and Film, The Real Deal. And uh, Andy, in December, was also in a theater production of Largo, which was based, which was the play that the 1948 film featuring Humphrey Bogart was based on. Andy, of course, was also nominated for an Emmy and Golden Globe for playing Arturo Sandoval in the movie For Love or Country. Uh, if you are a fan of jazz and film, you're going to love this episode because we are all fans of jazz and film. And in Andy's case, we are both fans of long suffering fans of the Miami Dolphins because he is, of course, from our neck of the woods down here in Miami. Anyway, they are both here. They are ready to talk jazz and movies. Let's go ahead and bring them in. Richard, Andy, are you there? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks for joining me. Um, you know, Richard, the new album is awesome, and I would love to, to get into that in a minute. But I'm curious as to, you know, you both obviously swim in similar oceans, uh, both being, you know, act in the movie industry, but this deep love for music. When did you first cross paths? I'm curious. Richard. Yeah, I, um, a good friend of mine who's a very close associate with uh, Joe Pesci when I did The Irishman. Uh, you know, that's when I met Joe, but his, uh, the person that's very close to him, Jay Stefan, he and I became good friends on that movie as I did with Joe as well. And uh, Andy lives in the same neighborhood as Jay and Joe, I think. And uh, when I went out there about two years ago, uh, Jay took me over to Andy's house and we sat down and we had a nice conversation. And then I went out again and went over to his house and he's, you know, he's right, right around the corner. And we had many, you know, musical conversations. We dabbled in film a little bit, but mostly our kind of passion and love is with music. So we kind of hit it off in, in that uh, area. That's awesome. Yeah. Because Andy, I know you growing up in South Florida, um, Music was really kind of your first passion. I know Kachow, you know, was a big influence on you. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Because when I talk to a lot of musicians who grew up in Miami, one of the first things they say was just the incredible diversity of music they had at their disposal growing up. You know, because there's jazz, uh, Cuban music, music coming over from the Caribbean on the radio. Was that the case for you? Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. I grew up obviously in Cuba. I left when I was five and a half, a couple of years, uh, two and a half years after the revolution. And growing up in Miami Beach, I was introduced to first. I'm obviously I have the Cuban music ringing in my ears since an early age from Cuba, listening to it on the radio, and then listening to it later on on the Cuban radio in Miami. But really, my first influences was Motown. You know. Right. And I, I fell in love with Motown as a young boy and would fall asleep. I remember, I think my first LP I bought was uh, Temptations Greatest Hits. The beautiful blue, blue nice. cover with all the hits in the front. It was an extra, it's still one of the greatest, you know, compilation albums ever, I think, made. And I would listen to that thing all the time and fall asleep to it. It would drive my brother crazy who slept in the same room as me. And then, of course, I started collecting uh, Cuban music as I got older and started studying percussion at, uh, as an early teen, uh, Afro-Cuban percussion, you know, Congo, Congos and so forth. Right. And, uh, and that introduced me, when I started collecting, that introduced me to Kachao. And uh, once I heard Kachao's first record that I bought was Jam Sessions in Miniature, uh, yeah. that transformed my life. And I started collecting all his music and studying it. 
his music is like the Bible of Cuban music. You know, if you want to yeah. know how to play it and how the uh, how you function in in the orchestra, what your responsibilities are, uh, it's all in his records. The greatest musicians in Cuba are playing. The great greatest rhythm section rhythm section ever assembled is on those records. And uh, and so I began doing that and studying and. Uh, you know, to this day, it was always my first passion. Of course, I love movies, but at that age, I had no intention or thought of, of becoming an actor. I was just, I was enamored with movies and I go to movies and uh, it wasn't until I, I was a senior in high school that I took an acting class and by and was very stimulated and I was encouraged uh, by the teacher. And that, that was the year The Godfather came out and that yeah. blew my mind. And I said, that's what I want to do with my life. You know? No, that's funny. Very cool. Yeah. And lo and behold, you would go on to be an actor in The Godfather Part Three. So we'll put a pin in that and get back to that in a minute. But Richard, for you, how about you? Was a similar story? Was your first passion music? And what kind of music were you listening to growing up? You're a New York guy, right? Yeah, I'm uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay. An hour north. Yeah. Well, well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I loved music right from, you know, when I was 11 or 12, I started playing music. I played dabbled. I played saxophone a little bit and studied the flute a little bit. Um, but I remember listening to being introduced to actually Miles and Coltrane when I was like 12 years old, you know, my favorite things and a lot of nice. stuff as well. Yeah. My father was a piano player and uh, my brother played a little bit of drum. So I just gravitated towards that. And all through middle school and high school, I played, I was in a band and played right through college. I didn't go to college to study music. I was I was pre-law, but wow. I, I didn't want to do that. I mean, it was yeah. so. Um, yeah, so that that was it. And then I played for about ten years in New York City. Traveled around, did some recording and traveling and playing. And then I got into the transitioned into the the, the film business because I wanted to make some money. So, okay. okay. I, as a jazz, jazz musician, hey, jazz musician. Yeah, no, I can, I can certainly relate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it didn't matter whether it was jazz. I mean, I was playing other things too. By the way, I love the Temptations as well. I mean, I can't. How can you not? And the OJ's and all of those people. Oh yeah. So yeah, I was playing whatever I could play, but jazz was my love. But then I just, I had to make some money. I wanted to settle down and out of a family. So I transitioned out and did my first movie, Desperately Seeking Susan, uh, with Madonna. But I always loved music. I was always going to the club and I was still hanging out. I just really wasn't playing. And then 33 years later, it all kind of clicked and had some great opportunities to play at a club, which became like a club that I could play in any time I wanted. They just gave me the key. Wow. And the, the next thing I know, I was playing a lot, a lot of gigs with a lot of real good people. And, you know, I was just blessed to have these people let me you know, recut my teeth again and learn how to play. Right. So, right. I'm still learning. I mean, but, you know, I had a great gig last night with that Latin band, that Latin jazz band that uh, is, is is the CD and social distancing outdoor concert here in Bergen County. So that was great. So, you know, it was nice to, to play. There's not that many opportunities to play right now. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah, no, we all miss it. We all miss it, the live music. And that's, that's cool to hear that, you know, you did you did the you were there to cut your teeth in New York, which is kind of essential, you know, for for every jazz musician to be on the scene, you know, and Andy, I assume I assume there's a similarity in acting, you know, when you first get out to Hollywood and you're just scrounging for auditions. And how do you look back on those early days now? They were rough. They were rough. <laughs> I don't know. You, there wasn't a, not too many auditions. I'll tell you that much. It was it was rough. It was a rough going. You know, just just to find an agent is is a tough thing to do, and you have nothing really to show for for yourself. And uh, and then even if you have an agent, you have to be lucky that you get a good enough agent that's actually paying attention to you and sending you out. If you can't get out, you can't get an opportunity to to even fail because there's you know there's no opportunity. So. It was rough for me. It took me a long time to get going. You know, I started doing theater and slowly pe people saw your work on stage or in a class and they would kind of, you know, like like everything in life, someone hears you playing, you know, you're playing somewhere. He goes, hey, man, you got great chops. Yeah. And I want, I, you know, my friend needs a drummer, you know, so 
and that's the way it works. Someone says in acting class, hey, you know, you're really, you're, you're, you're a really good, good actor and so forth. And maybe the manager comes to this thing or he starts talking you up to his manager and then you meet and, you know, kind of that's the way it goes. It nose to the grindstone kind of thing. But it took many, 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 many years for me to get, to start getting opportunities to audition. I would say, well, I moved into Los Angeles in 78 and I didn't stop loading trucks and hammering shingles and working as a waiter until 1985. Wow. My were you job. doing any playing? Were you, I mean, were you keeping your chops up? Yeah, I, I, I just found a picture of, of my first apartment that I, that I had was a storefront apartment uh, where, you know, where I, I lived on the other side of the glass window, which was the storefront. I had a bed on the floor, uh, a crate, a milk crate, a wooden like a uh, produce crate with a little black and white television. And there's a picture of me behind my two, I brought from Los Angeles, from Miami, my set of, uh, my first set of Congress, which is a set of LP Palisades, red. And uh, that's what I used to have used as a dining room table. Wow. But yeah, I was wow. playing and learning, you know, and kept me sane. And then later on, you know, when I did my film, The Lost City, I picked, I started playing the piano when I, in 1990 when I was doing The Godfather to practice because my character in the movie played piano. And it took me 16 years of my life to, to make the film. And by then, I, you know, had, my piano chops got better. And I was able to compose the music for the, you know, on piano for the film. Yeah, and by the way, uh, sorry to interrupt, but no, you should uh, let your readers and, and watchers no, that, that that movie, The Lost City, is a real good movie to watch. It came out in 2004 or five, and a lot of people may not have heard about it, but it's really a meticulously put together, well-crafted film that he directed. And, and you know, it took him a long time to get it made. There are no free lunches in the music business or in the film exactly. business. Every, you know, no. he, hell, he just came out of nowhere. Nobody came out of nowhere. I mean, right. Yeah, thank, thank you, Richie, for that. I always felt that that uh, because I had to learn to at least fake the piano in the movie. I always thought that the, that some of the movie gods up there were going like, when, when we feel that you can actually play the piano, we'll let you make the film. You know? <laughs> Seven <laughs> years later, you know, they said, okay. You can do it. Well, right. it makes such a difference in watching a movie where you can tell that someone put thought into the scenes featuring musicians. I mean, yeah. you see so many where the trumpet's upside down and the guy's got his hands on the saxophone all wrong. And, yeah. you know, and when a movie gets it right. Symbol, and then you hear oh, the yeah. <laughs> Well, you can imagine when, when we did the movie, not to sidetrack, but when we did the movie about Arturo Sandoval, I had to play him. You know, I put a yeah. cat, we, we, Arturo and I produced all the music for the movie. And, you know, when he was doing all his solos and all the stuff, we had, I had a camera on him, you know? Yeah. Uh, that I could ever finger that thing or play the trumpet, really. But I wanted to see what the rhythm of it was. Obviously, I took trumpet lessons to get the aperture and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see, you know, what where he was. And Arturo would say to me, just just figure out, because you can play any note. Correct me, I think he said, you can play any note from any position on the trumpet, you know. Yeah, well, he can <laughs> because he's a master. The, the he rest can. of us mortals, the rest of us mortals, not so much. Yeah, it's it's we spoke with Eon Harold. Look at the rhythm. Look at the rhythm. Yeah. And then yeah. if I hold a note, then, you know, then hold that note, you know, memorize. But if not, just look at the rhythm. And people but think you, you, only have, you only have three valves. So at least you're yeah. okay. You're covered. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Probably. Yeah, we spoke. I don't know if either one of you saw the Miles Davis biopic, Miles Ahead. But the way that worked is that Don Cheadle was, they, they filmed him first playing. Yeah. And then Keon Harold, the trumpet player, had to retrofit a solo that would fit his fingerings. That oh, would make wow. sense to his fingerings. So uh -huh. it worked out really well. It was, it yeah, was also great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, Richie, hey, let's talk about the new album, man, because it is great. It is great. First oh. of all, let's shout out some of the guys in this ensemble. You have put together a heavy hitting ensemble, some real top New York musicians for this one. So, who's on the album? Uh, Vincent Herring's on. Yeah saxophone and bill o'connell uh is on piano you know bill's worked with a lot of latin latin groups and he did the arranging and yeah. uh, on, on it and uh paul bolenbach the guitarist who's worked with you know 
Joey D. Francesco and Steve Gadd and those guys. So he's great. And then uh, some local guys, uh, Michael Getz, who's from New York, and Paul Rossman, a percussionist and uh, a singer for one tune, Carol Scott, who did some yep. work with McCoy and the Voices album way back when in the 70s. Very McCoy. cool. And you yeah. do some singing on this one too, don't you? What's that? You do some singing on this album, don't you? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Just Carol. Very <laughs> nice. And it's a nice, it's a nice roundup of, you know, film music, um, some stage music as well. Um, what was that process like too? Because I'm sure you've got just in your brain reams of iconic uh, you know, movie songs. Um, what was the process like to narrow these down? You're just thinking of tunes that would make great jazz arrangements? Well, obviously, so much music that we hear today comes from film. I mean, yeah. you know, the contribution of film to music is, you know, endless. So uh, Bill and I sat down and we wanted to do some tunes that, first of all, some from movies that I had worked on. So I wanted to, I wanted to kind of, you know, connect that thread there. And then also tunes that a lot of people hadn't heard done before because people do albums and recordings of music and film. But we tried to stay away from the tunes that everybody does and, and try to put a different kind of spin on the on the arrangements. And, and we just sat down and came up with, you know, up with these tunes. Very nice. Yeah. yeah like you could... tunes, but but yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah. Seasons of Love on there is on there, which yeah. I thought. Uh was a great choice. You know, and Andy, you as a, a composer, um, you know, you kind of come to film scoring from a different perspective. What are some of the most memorable film scores for you? Well, there's been, I guess, so many. I mean, Nino Rota's work is fascinates me as well as uh, Morricone. Uh, but there's been some, of, of course, the Godfather theme has rings in my ear to this day. And the, uh, yeah. Richie, you know, Pay tribute to to that in yep. in, this, uh, in this album, and I, I think Richard's uh, drum solo on that on that tune is really quite beautiful on the album on, on the Godfather. Uh, but you know, there's been so many incredible scores. Uh, you know, the, all the Mancini stuff is incredible. You know, the the Henry Mancini stuff on the, especially I think the Pink Panther stuff is a, is an amazing yep. piece of writing for for the particular genre of that film uh you know there's been some scores from like the john barry you know that have been incredible i mean there's so many people you know alexander desplat now is uh, amazing you know all his stuff he's become a friend you know we were in the at the ghent film festival which is a music and film festival they honor composers and all composers come from all over the world and i happened to meet him there and he's a big fan of cuban music and stuff and he happened to be in, in LA and we were playing at the same time. It was like the Golden Globes or the Oscars or something. And we were playing at a, uh, an orchestra. I kind of inherited a lot of the guys that, 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 that played with uh, Kachao and I and the albums we did together. And we still have a band called the Cinesan All-Stars. Okay. And uh, he came to watch the band and sat in on flute. He's a flute player. And he said, oh, no, I haven't played in so long. And uh, Danilo Lozano, a great flute player, who's, who's our orchestra. He's in our orchestra, I gave him the flute and he played one tune and then and then he, he was looking around. And I said, stay, stay. And he said, okay, okay. He didn't want to leave the stage, you know. And he grabbed the maracas and he started playing it. Of course, of course. That's always the case. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's very infectious music, as you know. And uh, so he he uh, there's been so many, you know, out there. There's, there's so many, you know, Thomas Newman, you know. They're all over. And they're, they're, they're yeah. so cool. and you know Arturo Sandoval has been scoring a lot of films. He he won the Emmy just on the film we did about his life, yeah. and then and and uh, he's done the last two or uh, I did this movie with Clint Eastwood, The Mule, and Clint called me and said, you know what about you know Arturo uh, doing the music for this party sequence that we had in in Mexico, which was uh, played this cartel guy who was his party man. And I said, oh, we'll do that in his sleep. He'll do it like in five minutes. They'll take him to yeah. do, you know. And because uh, you can watch Arturo on Facebook or whatever, he composes like three songs a day, you know. <laughs> and he's not, you can watch him on Arturo trumpet. Oh, he's, 
Yeah, he's incredible. He's so he's so prolific. I'm a trumpet player too. A yeah, so you know, amateur he's, hack trumpet player, but he's still he's, 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 he's on another level. Yeah, and he plays the piano and all that. And then he also did Richard Jewell his last movie. You know? Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, technically, you know, unmatched. One of the guys who, if it's in his brain, it'll come out on the horn. Um, and the well, piano. But, and the piano, and he can sing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Andy, down in New Orleans. I mean, you're down there with a guy that that's a great trumpet player and composes a lot. It's Terrence Terrence Blanchard. Terrence Blanchard yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm Blanchard. not with him right now. He's upstairs asleep. You know, he. he <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't know Terrence, but yes, of course, he's incredible. The musicianship here is so beautiful. You know, I love New Orleans. You know, my son is going to a music industry program at Loyola University, so I'm here setting him up in his apartment and stuff. So. Oh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, say hi to Terrence for us. Um, you know, his stuff. Talk about another great film composer, all this stuff. Yeah. He's, he's yeah, he, had a great, he had a great yeah. CD out that, you know, had Anatomy of the Murder in Chinatown, all those great yes. with, with strings. That's a that's a great, fabulous record. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And that's a whole other genre of movie is, you know, movies that depict, uh, you know, musicians, um, you know, and Anatomy of a Murder. Yeah. Not necessarily a jazz movie, but that Duke Ellington score, uh, just brilliant. Now, and Richard, you've been in the trenches in the music Richard, industry. Is there a movie that you think particularly represents the musician's life or the jazz musician's life, you know, most accurately? Oh, well, listen, I mean, Round Midnight. I have, so that was my, yeah, that was my pick. I mean, yeah. Dexter Gordon. I had the pleasure of working with Dexter on, not musically, I would yeah. be wonderful to say that that's what I did. You know, Eddie Gladden went away and he asked me to play. That's not what happened. Uh, uh, I, he did. He was in the movie Awakenings, the Penny Marshall film with De Niro and uh, Robin Williams. And wow. he he plays piano. He's a patient in the psychiatric ward. And he had he had cancer at the time. It was right before he actually passed. And I remember talking to him. He had a tracheotomy because mm -hmm. He was real sick, but he did the movie and it was it was amazing to be around him. So that movie. Yeah. You know, and Clint Eastwood did Bird, you yeah, know, Bird so was great. Yeah. that was good. You know, I, I did a I did Across the Universe, which is not a jazz movie at all. But but the musical aspect of it, like Andy was talking about before and you were talking about, I mean, you've got to nail the music. It's got yeah. to be synced up right or else it, it looks amateurish. And yeah. and if it's done right, you've got to. You know, you, you well, great. You know, yeah. Sandoval himself, the movie we did about his life in Cuba was about his struggles for not only for human rights and for personal freedom, but the freedom to play jazz, which yeah. was not allowed in Cuba in those days, you know. And and uh, <laughs> it was amazing to hear his story for you know, when we kind of researched the movie about all the things that people go through. And I know a lot of you know, a lot of Cuban musicians that came over who. The people think that, that the Cuban musicians only play Cuban music. And you know, when you have people like Sandoval or Chucho Valdez or, or Paquito yeah. de Rivera, these are, you know, monster jazz artists who can play their cultural music, but their their interest is really jazz. You know? Totally. Yeah. I mean, Artur, I know, idolized Dizzy. Idolized yeah. Dizzy, yeah. you know. And that's what was so cool to see, you know, especially once some of the early jazz musicians come over, it was just a natural marriage, you know, the way Dizzy embraced Afro-Cuban music and together pretty much generated, uh, you know, Afro-Cuban jazz um, yeah. because they share a lot of historical roots. And yeah, uh, yeah you know, but before G Dizzy made that relationship with Chano Pozo, you know, created yeah. Manteca and, you know, changed a lot of the way things were written. Prior to that in New York, <clears throat> you had Mario Bauza. <clears throat> yeah. And he had it, you know, he was he was involved in the Cap Calloway Orchestra as an arranger and played with Dizzy and all that. And Dizzy and Charlie Parker and all those guys would come and sit in with Mario Bauza and the uh, Machito. When he had the band called Machito and his Afro Cubans. And right. there's recordings of, of the Machito with Charlie Parker and with Dizzy, you know. So these guys were already going like, how do we, how do we, you know, improvise? Because, you know, the, the, everybody in those days in the jazz was, you know, was in a swing 4-4 four, four kind of format. And they started right. see, seeing all these, you know, different rhythmic patterns of Cuban music. They were going, well, how do you, what do we lock into that? You know, it kind of, Charlie felt I could do the bebop thing over, you know, 
a, a Roomba pattern, you know, over three, two or two, three club or six, yeah. eight. So yeah. they were like, they really turned on to it. That's why Dizzy wanted to incorporate uh, the conga player. And there was Mario Bauzal said, I got a guy in Cuba. I'll bring, bring him over. His name is Chano Pozo. Chano, right. Uh, the whole notion of the discarga, right? Just this open yeah. jam, you know, yeah. let's just open it up and, and see where it goes. Yeah, it was a, a uh, match made in heaven. Yeah. Um, Richard, you know, again, because you worked in both worlds and we're talking about movies that get music right, do you think there's any truth? And you're both percussionists. So you could both probably answer this. Any truth to this notion that musicians and drummers especially have a natural knack for timing and therefore make, you know, good actors? Have you seen any evidence of that? That's the old notion that the, the rhythm, it's all about rhythm and timing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think timing in in in, uh, in you know in, uh, certainly in comedy is very 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 important. You know? Yeah. But in anything in a scene, and Richard will probably attend to this, is the rhythm of the scene and how how you play it or how you sit in it is can be the most effective thing. And also in editing, you know how you rhythmically put a scene together. Yeah. You know, how long do you hold on him? You know how quickly do you get out? How long do you hold the last shot? How long you know? What is the cutting pattern in that scene has a rhythm to it, and you have a rhythm of cutting like this, and then the last one goes like that. Yeah, and it goes, and then it fades out. You know, that's yeah. a rhythm thing, that, and that's so that yes, it's very much. Uh, you know, it's like life. You're either in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, right. I mean, listen, I'm not. I'm not an actor, and and you know, I mean, I. I, I wouldn't even want to try. It's hard enough getting rejected in the film business. I mean, in the, in the music business. I don't want to get rejected No, there. but I think, I think when you see, and you work with, with uh, Martin Scorsese, you know, yeah. often I would think, right, Richard? But you see that he, he uses a lot of people who are not necessarily Correct. professional actors. Correct. He, there's an authenticity to, to the person in the, in the world that he's creating, and he knows how to play with them and not, or you know, shoot them when they're not looking, or just say relax. And you know, and I, if if I if knowing Richie, you know, as a person and as a personality, and I was directing something, and I if I see him, I go, wait a second, I could see how I could use Richie's persona and his karma and his personality and his sense of humor. To, I could see how I can put him somewhere to service the movie because I'm looking for a guy, you know. And that's up to the director who, who can sort of manage that, you know, yeah. the orchestra, you know. Right. Oh, that makes total sense. I'll ask you the inverse then, Richard. You know, because Andy brought it up, this great drum solo that you have on the Godfather theme. What makes for, you know, in jazz especially, uh, a great drum solo? I found that, you know, my favorite tend to have an almost narrative melodic quality. But, you know, as a drummer, I'll ask you what, you know, in your opinion, with some of the best drum solos in jazz, what makes them stand out? Well... Listen, I, I mean, I, I like music, the the, comp, the the composite of the music more than a drum solo. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, I mean, a drum solo is a drum solo. That's you know, you know what makes it good, you know, the way you hit the drums and the time in between the time you're not playing the drums and all the figures you play. Um, yeah, melodically, I think it's great. I mean, I go back to because Andy can relate to this. I mean, there's a there's a record, or, or Orgy and Rhythm, Art Blakey did in the late 50s and he had Sabu on it and he had Philly Joe Jones and he had a uh, Pablo Valdez on, on, on percussion, Pablo Bat and and I mean, it's incredible, all these drummers uh, playing and it's really rhythmic and it's melodic at the same time. And it's simple, it's really simple. And it's the introduction of Afro uh, Cuban drumming, uh, you know, and, and jazz drumming. So, what makes a good drum solo? I mean, I don't know. It's just you know the it's, the way it's the way it's put together, the composition of it, and how it relates to the to the song. But I'm more into the, the music it's, it's itself. You know, if you get a solo, you know, I, I don't care about the flash. I mean, there was any, was there anybody that could play more physically? Uh, it was more physically adept than Buddy Rich. Nobody. I mean, no, I mean, right. this guy—he could tap dance on the drums and right. and be, you know, incredible. But you know, that's one style of drumming. There are other styles. You know, many styles of drumming. So, I, uh, you know, there, there, 
different drummers play different so play solos all they play them differently so th thank you for saying that's a good solo i mean i you know it's okay i you know whatever <laughs> but in know. service of the song that's what i yeah. often hear uh, what makes yeah, a good solo absolutely. it's in service of the song in know? service of the song and and i think also that you know that it's being discovered on yeah. a moment, moment basis that it hasn't been sort of pre-designed or you know it's, it's it's just like you step into the vortex of and boom, you're in and you just trust the discovery. The same thing with acting, you know, you prepare your character, you think about it, you know everything about them, but when you, and you know the objective of the scene, which you know the objective, what the song is, the thematic objectives, but then it's wide open. It's open for, let's see what happens. You know, I've had situations in movies with early, you know, what directors said before a scene, so, uh, so you're gonna come into the room, what are you gonna do? And you gotta go like, well, I'm here to, you know, I know why I'm here. <laughs> what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know yet. I haven't walked into the room yet. Yeah. I don't know what the room looks like. I don't know. I don't know how the people in the room are related to me. Are they paying attention? Are they not? Are they greeting me with smiles? Are they suspicious? I don't know. I haven't, you know, nor do I care. I'll see what, you know, I'll see what happens. And I think right. that's, you know, acting to me. I try, I approach it like kind of like, you know, like a jam session in a way, you know, so I'm ready to improvise, and I know how to improvise within the context of the story, which is the theme, not just right. random improvisation. But if I'm going to improvise, I'm going to try to service the story in the improvisation and service right. the scene. And I think the music is the same way. You're in service of the thematics you're doing, and if someone opens up and you want to go, you want to go, think, you know, right? Or and, and if everyone's oh, go ahead, no, Richard. Sorry, in the moment, say moment to moment, you know. Moment yeah, there's just spontaneity to the work that we do, you know, whether it's movie acting or playing. And, and as it relates to what the, the, the whole, that's how, that's how you approach it. And you can go anywhere with it. You know, yeah. I find that when I'm playing music behind somebody, I'm soloing in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, I, I, I appreciate that aspect of it more because it's contributing to something else. So anyway, yeah. there's, no, it's it's absolutely true because, you know, in jazz especially, real individualism comes out through the collective. I mean, if you think someone like Jimmy Cobb, you know, who on Miles Davis kind of blue, again, Richard, just like you said, it's nothing fancy. He's not out there doing double fills, but the sound of his, you got it, the ride symbol. Just playing quarter. <laughs> ride it's iconic. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's, a, there's an old saying in, in, in film acting, less is more, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, music yeah. too at times, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's like the thing, it's like a conversation. I've known this, you know, when I've, uh, one of my mentors and uh, teachers in the percussion uh, was Luis Conte, who's in my band, but he's also been my teacher, you know. You can't help from people who are at the top of their craft, you know. He's one of the great percussionists of the world. And uh, and I know when we play, you know, and, and we're playing a little bit and, 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 and uh, I just, you know, he does something and I just like that and I just kind of, Answer back, and he looks over and goes, Yeah, <laughs> you know, the look. Affirmation that they're, you know, you know, they hear what you're doing, and it's an affirmation of saying, Hey, that's nice, man. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> you know what, you know, it's not the precious moment of playing music. Oh. Like that, you know, you know yeah. what's really sad, by the way, I don't want to go into a sad place, but when you're playing music now with masks on, you don't get that feedback like i'm playing like last night i'm looking over at the percussions because there were two percussionists with us last night and i got a big smile on my face but nobody can see that i'm smiling it's with eyes it's and you know when you're right light up but you know there's a distance and and it's like because the give and take it's it's such a you know it's a visceral thing it's a visual thing it's it's yep. and you miss that aspect of it right now it's totally. interesting but i think i think spectators don't may not realize you know, just how much physical communication is going on during a live jazz set, you know, just from looking at people's faces, watching limbs, especially the drums, because you've got to lock in with everybody, you know, you with the heartbeat of the bass and if you're playing with a singer. Obviously, that's a whole nother style of playing. Um, very sensitive to the physical cues from these musicians. I can imagine it's so hard, socially distanced. My wife said to me last night, she was in the audience. It was outdoors. And she said, you didn't smile enough. I said, smile? Who the hell can see a smile? Yeah, it's yeah. tough, man. But I'm glad to hear you are back 
playing live because God, we miss live music, you know, oh, and uh, it's been tough. When's it going to come back? Oh my God. I know. I know. And you know, Andy, I know you've done, uh, we talked about uh, Key Largo, uh, you know, on that stage production. And I guess that's, you know, kind of a, in, in the film world, that would be a, a similar analogy is doing live theater. Um, anything, any, any, you know, chance you'll be getting back into theater soon or anything like that on the horizon? We or? have, you know, the, the idea of doing Key Largo is an idea I've had for many years to adapt to film. So we, to, for the stage, and we took the original play, which is much different than the film, actually, by Maxwell Anderson, and the screenplay that, that Richard Brooks and, and John Huston wrote, which is much different than the play. And we took yeah. those two sources and kind of did a hybrid, brought some ideas from the original play and some new ideas onto the screenplay with Jeffrey Hatcher and myself, a screenwriter and dramaturg. And we put it on and we had great success with it. We got offers, you know, right away interest uh, from New York and in a company that has theater, a bunch of theaters in New York and a bunch in London. And then this, the pandemic, you know, the pandemic hit. So now we had, you know, who knows when there'll ever be live theater again. I don't know. I'd like to do it again. It was great fun. I played the, uh, the role that Edward G. Robinson played in the film, Johnny Rocco. So. And uh, Doug Hughes, a great uh, director out of New York, came in uh, and, and directed the piece uh, at the Geffen Playhouse. But it, it was a gas, you know. Uh, but, you know, I worked Arturo in was involved in that as well. What's that? Arturo. Arturo wrote, uh, wrote the, uh, the, the, there was like four yep. movies, the opening trumpet solo, all, all trumpet solos. Yeah. Uh, there was about, there was the end of the first act, the beginning of the second act, and the, the, he wrote a noir piece, which I'll send to Richard, he'll send it to you, uh, for the, you know, for the end of the play, this, uh, orchestral noir piece, that's beautiful, the Quilargo theme. Uh, I worked on a film on Sunday. One day, a Guy Ritchie movie with Jason Statham and myself. And, and uh, everybody was there. There was a whole, you know, everybody was masked up and hygiene everywhere. Every time you got out of the car, people come in and wipe the car down. And and it moved. There was, you know, obviously we took our masks off and when we right. were on camera. But, uh, you know, they were, I'm glad they were, you know, people are beginning to start working on those things, you know. And we hope we get through this thing. As are we, man. And uh, listen, in the meantime, we have some great music to look forward to. Again, Richie's new album uh, coming out September 25th. Correct, Richard? Yes, correct. Yeah. 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 On Savant Records, uh, you know, music and film, the real deal. Uh, it's a really good album. Peter Gunn is on Thank there. You. Peter <laughs> Gunn. Was that a Blues Brothers shout out? Talk about great. Uh, no, that was just uh, <laughs> homage to uh, Henry Mancini. Hey, by the way, Lalo Schiffer, too. Yeah, Lalo, yeah. I can't forget Lalo. That's I got right. to know Lalo. He almost scored a film that I produced, and uh, he's a very lovely guy. Yeah, he wrote incredible themes, all all those themes for all those television shows and stuff like that and, and films. And, yeah. Right, right, right. Absolutely. No, it is it is a great record, and uh and uh, yeah, again, something amazing to look forward to. Again, September 25th on Savant Records, Richie Barada's new album, Music and Film, The Real Deal. Um, it has been amazing talking to you both. This, this has been incredible uh, talking to you about two of my favorite subjects, which would be movies and jazz. So really, thank you uh, to the both of you. Yeah. You know, I really want to extend my thanks to, to you and Brian uh, and to Andy as well for being so generous and taking the time out of his busy schedule to... Oh yeah, we're, we're really we're really busy over here, you know. <laughs> yeah, well. I'm busy. I'm busy building IKEA furniture. <laughs> oh, but college. Yeah. What's interesting is, well, I'm going to show you real quick because this would be a good out. I'm going to turn this around. What's interesting about this house that we found that was a friend of ours was generous to turn me on to. Look what's in this hallway. Oh what yeah. Got here. Yeah. You see it down there. <laughs> I see, yeah, the piano. Yeah. Oh, the piano. Oh, yeah. beautiful. So that's kept us, you know, now I'm doing a little thank you. Back. Uh, you get your chops back. Yeah, gives yeah. you that. But uh, yeah, everybody should check out this record. It's, it's a beautiful homage to the music and film, and Richie's band is beautiful. Uh, there's so many beautiful cuts in there. And I kept, when I got to the Alfie cut, I kept playing that back again and again. I think I played like four times before I moved on to the next. Next song, so beautiful. Yeah, beautiful tune. Thank you. Well, what a melody, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. You're playing is awesome. Vincent's just a killer saxophone player. Bill, everybody sounds great, man. It's a yeah. very nice record. Well, Andy and I are going to play in the near future. We yeah? Hope. Yeah, why not? Un 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 unmasked. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Andy, would you ever cut a jazz record? Uh, yeah, I'll cut. Listen, you don't have to bend my arm to sit in and do a record. Uh, you know, I did those last four records, me and Kachow, and and I've yeah. written music for movies other than Lost Cities, you know, songs and stuff. So, And I've had this, you know, I've been working on original tunes. I have a lot of original tunes that I've been working on that I'd like to begin to archive and, and produce. So that's my next... Once we can get back into the studio, I, uh, that's kind of like uh, the next thing in my life. I want to, I want to get all those tunes uh, organized and recorded. Yeah, That'd do it. Do yeah, it. That'd be incredible. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Andy Garcia, Latin jazz on the way. But anyway, again, thanks to you both. This was this was a great way to start my Friday morning, and it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Well, Good thank you. Good job. That's what fins up. I wasn't going to bring up the dolphin. I want to keep this a happy conversation. Ed. No, no, we, uh, have, we have a lot of promise. We got a lot. That's, of that is true. Uh, Brian Flores is a great coach. Yeah, that, a great we bring coach. up the dolphins. It'll take the entire show to talk about, about it, Richard. Oh, you, just you, yeah. you now, you know. Hey, I don't want to hear about. I don't want to hear about your miseries. I'm a Jet fan. Come on, please. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, you've had enough misery. I'm also a Nick fan and a Met fan. Now, come on. Oh, you know. You know there are good teams in New York, Richard, right? To root for? <laughs> you know, you, you root for who you root for. There's no right. that, you know. So. Yeah, you're all that's in. Right. You're all in. We're all in with the Dolphins. That's, that's okay. right. This yeah. is the year. All yeah. right. Yeah, if they right, play. Yeah. <laughs> if they play. That's, a, yeah. that's the big thing. All, all right, right, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Likewise, man. All right, Brian. Thank you. Richie. Right. Thank you. We'll talk. Thank you very much. So long, everyone. Wow. So thank you to today's incredible guests, Andy Garcia and Richard Barada. Again, Richard's new album, Music and Film, The Real Deal, is coming out September 25th on Savant Records. Be on the lookout for it. It is really, really good. I uh, want to quickly thank one of this episode's sponsors. That would be the Jazz Refest. They're putting on a virtual festival this Sunday, August 23rd, featuring a bunch of great UK artists, Finker Golding, Sarah Gour, Steen Down, MC Maurice, Golden Mean, Jay Kaiser, and Anthony Joseph. Uh, it can be streamed uh, at the Jazz Refresh YouTube channel. Or it'll be broadcast at the same time on MQA studio quality equipped Blue Sound Blue OS devices. I've got one right here. It'd be this uh, PowerNode 2i. If you own a Blue Sound uh, device, you can access this online audio festival for free. Uh, anyway, that'll do it for today's episode. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm Brian Zimmerman. I will see you next time. So long. <laughs>